Hello and welcome to this video in which we are going to analyze the prim and proper technique of the pure-blooded Englishman Julian Alexander Brame. Well, actually, no, not really. We're not really going to do that. We are going to look at some of the movements of the technique of the late, great Julian Brame. But if you've seen any of these technique analysis videos that we've done so far, then you'll already know kind of what we're on the lookout for. Uh, we may touch on some things that are prim and proper, you know, some well-functioning uh, principles that are, that are amazingly adhered to and things like that. But we're really on the lookout for strange things, things that are different, uh, things that maybe you've never thought about or never tried before, and things that are really amazing to find, you know, when you see a great musician at work. Julian Bream has always kind of struck me as someone who had an approach to the guitar that was kind of rough around the edges, uh, just in terms of maybe comparing him to some of his contemporaries. Thinking back, I don't think I could actually kind of put my finger on why. After, you know, listening to a lot of his playing and watching a lot of his performances and doing all the research for this video, I think I have pinpointed some reasons that kind of make me think that. But his approach has kind of always struck me as more kind of grunt and bear, just do whatever you have to do to get the job done type of guitar playing. And I gotta say, some of the things that Bream does are amongst the strangest things that I have ever seen uh, any guitar player do, and definitely amongst the strangest things that we've ever seen in this series. Uh, so we're going to kind of have a crescendo, a gentle crescendo of strangeness as we go throughout these points. We're going to start with some more general things and then get a little bit weird as we go. And then, uh, you know, we're going to pull out all the stops by the end for sure. So the first thing that I want to talk about is usually the first thing I kind of look for, which is somebody's general approach to plucking hand technique, you know, general free stroke. Most of these types of guitarists, the technique that they're going to be using the most is free stroke. So I just kind of want to look at how their hand is set up and uh, how they execute it. So I wanted to start with this angle because I just love this angle. You know, I, I probably have said this before, but you know, the angle that captures the front of the plucking hand where you just see the back of the wrist is really missing everything. From this kind of underneath point of view, you really get to see all the things that are happening. So for just kind of a general appreciator of music or the guitar, you can say like, oh, well, you know, uh, look at those fingers. They're really going, right? I didn't realize that. Lots of stuff. For someone that is a little more interested, uh, maybe somebody that plays the guitar themselves, okay, we can see some of what's going on here with this point of view. So what kind of really struck me is a couple things. You know, one, based on the way that his hand is shaped and his fingers are shaped, he has like a very long fingered free stroke. In this piece, uh, he's playing uh, a Bach fugue here and he's doing pretty much free stroke, it looks to me, on all this. And you can see kind of how long his fingers look. They're very straight. Uh, for many players, including myself, when you set up your hand for general free stroke, your fingers are just a little bit more curled. I don't know what causes that. Something to do with how your fingers work with the thumb, I would, I would guess. But it looks like he just has a very nice long mechanism in which to make his free stroke. From this other shot, uh, this is actually a video that he's talking about problems that he had with his left hand. So uh, we're going to come back to this. But you can see from this angle, you know, here he's playing free strokes, but they look like, you know, his finger looks so long, like his middle joint is just barely bent and his finger is so in front of the string, it looks like he could basically just with the tiniest change of angle, make them rest strokes if he wanted. And there are some passages that we'll look at later. And I don't know if he's playing free stroke or rest stroke. It could be either one and I can't tell by the sound but it just looks like even in his normal free stroke, man, he's just getting a ton of meat out of the sound, a very, very big sound. And uh, maybe this is part of what made it happen. The finger is really in front of the string and he's utilizing a very long finger type of stroke in his approach. 
Something else I do want to point out is look how efficient his strokes are. So I was taught for the, you know, quote unquote general rule. When you do free stroke, your finger should not move further than the next string, the next adjacent string, right? Just as a general rule of thumb, uh, no pun intended. And I mean, look at this and tell me if he ever breaks this rule. You know, we're going to look at some rules later that, you know, don't exist for, for Bream. Uh, but this, this isn't one of them. I mean, his moves are extremely efficient. A very direct movement of energy going into the instrument. And I believe that's how you find moves like this. You may start by saying, well, I'm going to try and shorten the amount that I move. Or maybe I'm moving too much. It causes me to be inaccurate, things like that. But I believe at least at some point it's got to be the response you get from the guitar. It's got to be the sound you're looking for and you realize that's how you get it. That's how you get it the most. And you say, oh, well, I want all my notes to sound like that. So extreme control and discipline in terms of efficiency of movement. So going back to this clip for just a minute, I want to start talking about the arm. So I think something that gave me the impression that you know, his approach to the guitar was a little more visceral than some other people, was the amount of arm movement. So to really focus on something like this, instead of looking at his hand or wrist, I kind of pick something else to focus on and then see how much does that move. And then I can kind of gauge how much other parts of his body may be moving. So in this shot, I focus on the buttons on his jacket <laughs> um, because you know, those are on, on the jacket sleeve, which is on his arm. And you can just see how much they're bouncing up and down. Then I can kind of go and look at the wrist, the hand, and then, you know, theoretically follow the arm the other way and realize, wow, his arm is really bouncing up and down a lot. The movement is, is very small, but there is a lot of arm going into his strokes. And it looks to me like in passages like this, there's arm going into every single stroke. And this is really fascinating to me because this is something that I've been experimenting with a lot lately. You know, how much can the arm help you? And just kind of wondering, could you put the arm into every single stroke? Is that even possible or is it beneficial? I do know some guitarists that would say no. But in music like this, and we're going to look at some other examples too, it looks like that's exactly what Bream is doing. With every stroke, he's moving his arm and it's part of it. Here's a passage where he's playing, uh, this is the, the fifth bagatelle by William Walton. So he's got you know, these rapid passages if you're familiar with that piece. And look at the bouncing of his hand and arm. It's just going nuts. I mean, the hand is bouncing, but it's connected to the arm that's bouncing, right? And there's a few different things you can focus on in this shot and you can just see everything moving. You know, for one, at the beginning of the shot, you can focus on like his forearm up to the elbow, even up to his shoulder. And it's kind of hard to see because the movement is still very controlled. But I almost call this like a tremor technique that he has. Because it's a lot of movement, but it's so finely controlled it's a lot of movement in terms of like velocity, let's say, but not a lot in terms of like a wide range. I mean, it's, it's extremely refined, really interesting. So you can see kind of the tremor coming from his shoulder down through the elbow, the forearm, right? And then by the time it gets to the hand, you can just see the hand just going nuts. And then it's interesting uh, as the camera angle changes, you also see it in the shadow that his right hand makes on his guitar. Look at the shadow. And you just see it just like spazzing out. <laughs> um, really, really interesting technique. In this shot, he's playing the first movement of the Malcolm Arnold Guitar Concerto. And I love this performance. Uh, this video, it used to be up on a different channel and then they took it down and I was really sad. Uh, for multiple reasons, but then someone re-uploaded it and I was really, really happy because there's some great shots of his playing. I love this performance. I've played this piece. Uh, I've got to perform it a couple of times and of course this was like my go-to study 
I mean, I wanted to know how he played it. And the white tuxes, I mean, you just gotta love that, right? Can't get enough of white tuxes. So here he's playing a rapid scale passage. And man, look at the movement of the hand. Now he's older here, right? I don't know exactly how old, but later on in his life. And what's interesting to me about seeing the trimmer type technique is that, you know, it functions really well for him. It's not, it's not too strenuous. It looks strenuous from, you know, an observing point of view, but it's extremely functional. So if he needs to play a fast scale, well, he just really moves the arm, right? And I can't tell here if he's playing free stroke or rest stroke. It could be either one. Now, here's a shot of that same clip and you just see the elbow. And I mean, I think this is really interesting. So you just see this little tremor, right? You see it shaking back and forth. You see a lot of movement actually as well from side to side as he descends. This is a descending scale. So as he comes down the strings, you see that's how he moves uh, with the arm and you just see that shake. And here's just another clip of the same thing. So this time he's playing an ascending scale. So you can see the hand tremoring. Uh, he's playing fast. You can see the elbow and arm moving. And if we isolate the arm and elbow, I think you can even see it a little bit better here. You can just see it kind of shaking back and forth. It almost looks kind of eerie to me. Like if you were just to kind of see this in the dark and not know what it was, the movement, uh, it, you wouldn't know what to associate it with. <laughs> you might not think off the top of your head, like, oh, world, world-class guitarist playing a concerto. <laughs> uh, it might kind of freak you out a, a little bit. So we've seen some examples of his right hand tremor technique and that he even does it in really rapid passages. But I started to wonder, is there ever a point where, you know, the notes are too fast for him to do the tremor thing? Well, what I found was that there is a point where he will stop tremoring and he will utilize the arm differently when the notes become fast enough. So we're gonna look at a couple of examples in which that happens. This first one is the, I guess the C section, the fast arpeggio passage from Villalobos A2 to 11. As a comparison, this is before he gets to that arpeggio section. So you have these, these rapid chords that you have to pluck. So look at how much movement is going on here. You see the hand bouncing up and down. Okay, so that looks to me like he's putting in the arm movement with each one of those strokes. Now you can see as he switches to very fast arpeggios, the movement changes and becomes much more smooth. There is just kind of one downward movement with the arm for each, each arpeggio, each P-I-M-A-M-I -M -I arpeggio. And I kind of pinpoint the, where the arm comes from with this shot uh, by the knuckles, the big knuckles. And of course it happens on the thumb stroke. And, it, and as they come down a little bit, it's like, okay, that looks like he's kind of putting juice into it with the arm. And then the fingers are working really, really smoothly. And I gotta say, some of his technique really struck me as quite smooth. When he wanted to be, he could be extremely smooth. And here's another example of him doing the same thing uh, in this instance, he's playing tremolo. And he's playing the famous Targa tremolo. And you can just tell right off the bat, there's no tremor going on. So you look at his arm, you see a tiny bit of movement, but it's like very relaxed looking. It's very smooth, not bouncing up and down. The fingers are operating in a, in a very flowing type of movement. And it looks very different, very different. So when things get fast enough, uh, there's no more tremor, and there's a much more smooth sequence of events going on. Next, I want to focus a little bit on the fourth finger of Breen's fretboard hand, his left hand. Now, I'm, I'm always interested in people's fourth fingers on their fretboard hands because, you know, some people use them just like all of the rest of their fingers. They stay nice and curled. They come down from the big joint and they angle their hand in such a way so that it functions that way. But there are many great players that it kind of looks like they do something totally different with their fourth finger. 
You know, it operates differently than the other three. So I noticed in Bream's playing that he's one of these people. So we have these shots from this video in which he's talking about his left hand, talking about some serious issues that he had with it. And, and I suppose in this video he's demonstrating some exercises that he at this point had to do to retrain his left hand. You know, what is interesting here is I don't know what he's retraining. In typical well-known persona type of fashion, he doesn't actually, you know, answer the question. What was the issue? He doesn't say. He just says, I had big issues. He says he thought he might have to stop playing. So they did, they did sound very serious. If you know some information about this, I would love to know. But I can't tell just by seeing the exercise what it was. It could have just been like in the way that he was gripping or something like that. But what you can see here is the fourth finger operating totally differently than the other three. Now, I do think that in these exercises, you know, he's going through all the fingers and the other three remain on the string. So, you know, the fourth finger you can see is kind of flapping around and flying around, almost like whimsical in a way. So the other three, I mean, they can't do that if they remain on the fingerboard. Maybe that's part of the exercise. But the fourth finger definitely has a different type of movement. And, you know, the third finger might be doing some of this too, like it might have the opportunity to, but you don't really see it happening. What I see in his fourth finger is, yes, you know, definitely the big joint is involved, but also the middle joint and maybe even the tip joint too, it opens up. So he doesn't just lift it from the big joint. When he lifts it, it doesn't remain in this curled state. It opens up. So it's a different movement and it's just part of his technique. And, you know, we're going to talk some more about his left hand technique later on in some different ways. But this video comes from after he had pinpointed the issues. So, you know, whatever he's doing differently with the fourth finger here is not what caused his issues. This is him actually saying, no, I'm trying to train my hand to always do this. Uh, but the fourth finger, it just moves differently. There is an opening up motion and no doubt he knew how to utilize it because, you know, he never misses with it. It comes back down and lands wherever he needs to. Um, in this passage here, he's playing a, a box prelude. This is a great video, by the way. They made it look like he's at some dinner party and as he starts to play, like everyone in the party stops what they're doing and oh, what is that wonderful sound? And, like the cook comes out of the kitchen and, and it's like, oh, what is that? It, it's kind of funny. Uh, but this is a long passage in which, you know, you can look at the left hand and you can see him do this opening up of the fourth finger type of thing. Instead of the fourth finger just lifting and coming down from the big joint, pretty much like all the other ones do, it will at times involve this open motion in which it kind of sticks out. And then in order to come back, it has to close and utilize the middle and tip joints to do that. And there's a few moments here where, you know, I've seen other players do this maybe kind of in their own way, maybe not exactly like Bream, but where they they move their fourth finger when, you know, basically you don't have to. And, and I wonder what it's about. You know, one of my theories is that it might be for balance. Uh, one of my favorite guitar techniques is Al Zapua. And you can use your fourth finger when you do Al Zapua for balance, where you're not actually like playing with the fourth finger except it balances your hand, it helps it go into motion. And maybe, I mean, it would make sense to me that it's at least a possibility that you can do the same thing with your other hand. And there's some moments here where he kind of sticks it out suddenly or kind of flexes it a bit or like shoots it out when it's not being used. And so it just makes me wonder. And this is just one more example of kind of his fourth finger at work when it's not always being used. He's playing the loop here, which I didn't really want to use a lot of loop footage because I don't know anything about the loop. So for all I know, the technical approach is like way different. 
Although to me it looks like he played it pretty much the same as the guitar, like pretty much exactly the same. But you can see his fourth finger sticking out, I would say more than normal. It kind of hangs out there sometimes when it's not being used, when other fingers are being used. So it just kind of makes me wonder. Maybe it's a balance thing, maybe it's a comfort thing. So now we're going to gradually uh, progress in terms of things getting a little bit more strange. So here we have a couple of instances of Bream doing vibrato, which he had very characteristic vibrato, kind of like a trembling type sound. And I chose these two clips because it shows two different ways of him getting it. So this is the, that same Malcolm Arnold performance. This is the second movement where you have these long passages with uh, like lead lines, single note lines. So great opportunity to use vibrato in a lot of places and he certainly does. What stuck out to me was his thumb on his left hand. So when he holds a note and does vibrato, you can see his thumb shaking back and forth. So it looks like when he has a big vibrato, he does release the thumb from the back of the neck and it is no longer on. And I make that assumption because of how fast it's shaking. You know, it looks to me like it's not touching anything because it's just moving back and forth so fast. If it is touching, it has to be just very so slightly. And then of course you see the shake going throughout his arm. That's kind of what's what's initiating the vibrato. So interesting to see the thumb really moving there. In this next passage, okay, now he's playing octaves. So he has two notes to hold down and his approach changes. Uh, now he just says, well, I'm just gonna shake the whole dang guitar <laughs> and I'm just gonna move it back and forth. So he frets these octaves, the thumb remains I mean, you can't see the top of it, but it looks like at the bottom, the thumb isn't moving independently from the guitar like it was prior. Uh, he just is moving his arm, shaking the whole guitar. And that's how he's getting his vibrato here. So a different approach. Uh, and, you know, I think it has to be based on what he's fretting. The necessity to fret two notes instead of one and the shape that he's using to fret them must necessitate the fact that now he has to go about it this way because then he goes back to the previous technique. So the texture changes, now we're back to single note stuff, and you have the opportunity to just play one note at a time, and now when he does vibrato, you can see his thumb shaking like before. So two interesting solutions to adding vibrato onto notes in two different scenarios there. So now we're gonna get a little bit more strange. So this is the one thing that I had noticed before, and I call it frog finger technique, <laughs> okay? And this is really interesting to me. So you probably have been taught, and if you're a teacher, you've probably taught yourself, you've probably taught your own students this yourself, okay? It's like an unbreakable rule, you know, with the fretboard hand, don't ever let your tip joints collapse. You keep them firm, you keep your fingers curled. Oh, except Bream is not doing that at all. And this is just beyond fascinating to me. So this is well after he had discovered his left hand issues. So, it, you know, it makes me think, well, this was not the issue. I remember seeing this video and watching him do this. And then, you know, I had heard that he had a history of hand issues and I thought, well, maybe it's that, you know. People tell you not to do this because they. one of the reasons is they say it's bad for your hand. It's like using, using the joints against the other parts of your hand. And uh, that may be true, I, I don't really know. Personally, myself, I kind of try and keep my tip joints curled. There are occasional exceptions. But, you know, seeing what Bream is doing here is really interesting. This is back to the first movement of the Malcolm Arnold and He's actually playing these passages pizzicato with the right hand, but they are basically like little scale runs, single line stuff, okay? And you can see where he's fretting the strings uh, on, on, on what part of the finger he's using to fret. The only thing that I can think that he's going for here is maximum fingertip on the string. 
because he bends his joints at will, you know, especially second, third, fourth finger. When he frets, he's like deeper into the finger than you typically see. Typically, people say, you know, fret on the tips, but he's even beyond that point. My only guess is that he's just going for maximum flesh on the string, maximum fingertip. And since he's doing single line stuff here, he can kind of do it at all costs because he doesn't play the whole movement like this. He only uses it in certain areas. So let's look at this in a few more instances. And then uh, we're gonna find out, you know, has he always done this? Or is this like a, a thing that he discovered later? You know, was, was this the source of his issues? Well, um, I'll give you my, my theory. But here is him playing a passage. Uh, this is the main theme from the first movement of the Malcolm Arnold Guitar Concerto. And I'm showing this passage because um, it's a beautiful passage of music, but very tricky. Uh, multiple voices going on, uh, lots of barring, lots of shifting, you know, carrying on melodies across multiple strings, all kinds of stuff. Uh, throwing in some harmonics here and there, stuff like that. So here you can see that he does at times utilize the, you know, what I call frog finger technique. And I've kind of paused some moments where you can see the tip joints bend, he's more flat fingered and he's using the frog fingered thing. It looks like most of the time it happens with the third finger, sometimes with the second finger. In these instances here, okay, you can just see him playing one note and he uses the third finger and it looks like the tip joint is just slightly, you know, flexed the, the quote unquote wrong way, right? He's not using a curled finger approach. And it looks like he's using like, you know, the very big part of his finger. What's interesting about these notes here, if you were to hear the audio, is that they're harmonics. They're natural harmonics. So this supports my theory that for certain sounds, he's just going for maximum flesh on the string. So I started to wonder, when did he start doing this? Did he always do this? So I started to look up videos of him playing when he was younger. And here's the clip from the Bach prelude that we saw earlier. It's a, it's a good long shot of his, of his fretboard hand. And I watched this and I studied it and it looks to me like not one time does he do the frog fingered thing. And you know, this is, this is Bach. So a lot of challenges with the fretboard hand, a lot of shifting, stretching, bar chords, okay? And he never really uses that technique. Okay, sometimes his fourth finger uh, might wave around or be a little flat, but I still feel like I never once see that tip joint depress and kind of move the other way. And I started to look at other videos of him and I really did not find this. So I don't know if it's just something that he developed later the only other instance that I even saw of this type of thing happening whatsoever is this video here where he's playing the soar B minor. Uh, and he's older here than he was uh, in the Malcolm Arnold performance. And uh, this is his home. This was his home, isn't it? And when you see this shot here from the side, okay, he's holding a chord and you can just very briefly see that third finger tip joint just give this little wiggle. And within the same chord shape, it goes from that tip joint being curled to that tip joint depressing a little bit. It almost looks like a feel thing. Like he kind of wiggles it almost to feel the note differently. Uh, that's just kind of my best guess. But that was really the only other instance where I found it. But I do want to show one final thing about this technique that I'm obsessing over. And this, when I found this, I just got so excited because I, I just look for this kind of stuff when I make these videos. So we're back to the first movement of the Malcolm Arnold. And here he's gonna go from those pizzicato scale passages to, uh, he, then he goes right back into the main theme of the piece, okay? And look what happens at this moment. 
he switches from frog finger technique to like normal traditional finger technique. So he comes in on the last line of that pizzicato section. He's got the, the bent tip joint of the third finger and then he keeps it on the fingerboard and then flexes that joint into a bent state. I mean, what is going on? So what this tells me is this was an absolute part of his technique because it looks to me like he's saying, yeah, for that passage, I need the bent tip joint. That's what I need for the sound. For this next passage, I need the curled firm tip joint, literally flexing and unflexing a tip joint of your finger based on whatever it is that you need to go for. Okay, so now for the big finale. So you may have been taught by someone at some point to play the guitar more with your body, okay? You may have taught this yourself if you teach lessons. You may have you know, heard or said something like, hey, you know, use your arm here. Or, you know, hey, sit up straight and you can kind of feel your back when you play and you can kind of feel your shoulders and it gives you, gives you some strength, okay? My teacher said that the great Illyrio Diaz said that great tone comes from your stomach. Well, how about that? That's pretty weird, right? But what about playing the guitar with your face? So, I'm not talking about, you know, making expressions when you play. There's plenty of people that do that and it is, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say in a way it's not really connected to the music that's coming out. It's theatrical in the sense of, well, they want to get into this mood so they're going to also show it in that way, okay? That's just kind of my interpretation. And there's some shots here of Bream, I think, doing that exact thing, okay? because he would do that. Moving the head a lot, you know, grimacing, making the facial expressions, all that kind of stuff. But I wanted to show you some of those clips to then say, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about literally playing with your face. So in this clip, this is where I first noticed it. Uh, this is the same video we saw before where he's playing uh, Villalobos A211, okay? And he's playing the A section, the opening section. So if you know this piece, well, you can just hear it, right? Look at his facial movements. With each melody note, with each little background chord, there's a movement in his face, in his cheeks, or his eyebrows. And it is absolutely in sync with the music. And I'll give you just a little bit. I can't use a ton of audio, but I can use like a few seconds so you can hear how it perfectly syncs up with the music. You know, at first I thought, okay, well, interesting. He's moving his face. But then I thought, no, it's a lot more than that. For most people to sync it up like it's synced up with his playing, it would require extra coordination. It's like doing something along with playing, okay? Like, have you ever tried to tap your foot while you play? It can be done, yeah. For a lot of people, it's really hard to do. Why? Because it's a whole different thing. You have to play and also tap your foot. For someone like myself, let's say, as an example, if I were to try and move my face and time it with the music, that was coming out of the guitar, it would take a lot of work. It would take a lot of practice. So much so that I don't think it would be worth it because it would be too difficult for me. But I found multiple instances of him doing this. And then I realized, well, this is just the way that he played. I mean, he might have been doing this since he was a little boy. In fact, I bet that was probably the case. Here he's playing Via Lobos Prelude 4. He's playing the A section. So once again, if you know that piece, you can just hear, and he plays a melody, and then he plays uh, the, the responding chords, and you get a little gesture with each one. And I interpret this as the music just pouring out of him, you know? It doesn't look like it's something that he could turn off. He doesn't do it, like, exclusively. I noticed that in repeating sections, 
you know, he might not do it with every note or he might do it with every note. So I don't even know if it's something that he was conscious of. But the fact that it's absolutely synchronized, okay, it tells me that the music is really coming from within him. And that drive drives the facial movements. It simultaneously drives what's coming out of his guitar. That's why I say he's also playing the guitar with his face. Like he's not hitting the guitar with his face. He's not plucking the strings with his face. He's playing music with his face. It seems to be just as important a part of him playing music as the sounds that we can hear coming out of his instrument. So you're probably thinking, yeah, well, that's interesting, but that, you know, maybe that's not as weird as, uh, you know, I was expecting. Oh, but we're not done. So when I said, what about playing guitar with your face? That wasn't really inclusive enough. I should have said, what about playing the guitar with your whole head? Now, I want to show you this clip. This is from the video where he's playing the William Walton Bagatelles. So let me play this clip and you tell me what's moving here, okay? So first we've got the face movements and, and this is the fourth movement. So if you know it, you can imagine what's happening and you see eyebrow and, and cheek movements with each one, okay? But then the camera angle changes. Now you tell me what, what is moving, what moves? Yeah, so, so did you see what I saw? What I saw was that he was playing the music with his ear, his ear wiggles. Okay, and then I think I can give you just a little bit of audio. When you hear it with the audio, it's even more freaky, okay? I don't even know what to say about that. I think this is the one single strangest thing I've ever seen a musician do. And when he does the ear thing, it's not like, oh, well, he's also moving his, his cheeks and his eyebrows so the ear moves too. No, when he moves the ear, the rest of his face isn't moving. See, so he's moving his ear in particular. So like what I see is, oh, that other section, he plays it with his eyebrows and his cheeks. This part, he plays with his ears. And I mean, I just think that's the craziest thing that I've ever seen. Again, maybe this is totally uh, subconscious and he doesn't even know, but what an amazing example of using your whole body to play music and to feel music and to be musical. And I can just only imagine that if you can feel music in your body this way, well, that's what's gonna come out of the guitar. I mean, it's kind of impossible for it not to. So lots of people like to talk about the economy of movement. So I wonder if they've ever thought about it in terms of like your ears. When you play those harmonics in that piece and you move your ears, be careful not to move them too much. Only move them the right amount or it's too much movement in the ears. But I, I just thought that was really cool, really interesting and amazing. And it really did give me a deeper appreciation for him and just the depth from which he was coming from. So that's all that we're gonna talk about here. But uh, before you go, I do have one bonus uh, instance for you, okay? Because I, I just love this. So I remember this Malcolm Arnold performance for, for multiple reasons. If you've seen this ending, you know where I'm going with this. So. After the performance is over, okay, it went great, everybody's happy, oh, I was shaking hands, you know, shaking the conductor's hand, shaking the concert master's hand, everyone's going crazy, okay. And then someone is coming up on the stage, and who is it? Oh, well, it's Malcolm Arnold. Well, he's been there the whole time. So yeah, this is a thing, right? I've seen this before, so a composer comes on stage, and yeah, let's hug, shake hands, and yeah, he wrote the piece, great piece, we love it, okay? So Malcolm Arnold comes on the stage, and he and he's loving it. And then this next thing, I don't I don't know, like is is this a British thing, where it's like someone needs to strum a chord? So you know, Malcolm Arnold picks up the guitar and hands it to Bream, like, well, well, you do it, you know, you strum the chord, and Bream's like, oh no no sir, you you strum the chord, and then at that point Arnold's like, well okay, I'll strum the chord. So Arnold takes the guitar and he holds it, you know, rather strangely, 
and he strums this big open string chord. And the crowd goes wild, like this is this is the thing that they're supposed to do, right? Everybody loves it, like yay, and, and Bream is clapping. So, okay, now look at what Arnold does next. So instead of just turning around and handing Bream the guitar, he does this twirly thing where he spins the guitar around and like almost drops it on the floor and Bream has to like save its life and turns, you know, a very mundane kind of, you know, here's your guitar situation into almost a disaster. Like imagine if you would have dropped the guitar, shatters into a hundred pieces, uh, you know, in front of the audience, you know, then we probably all would have already heard of this performance already. It would have been the performance in which Malcolm Arnold destroyed Julian Bream's guitar. I don't know what guitar this is. I'm guessing it's either one of Bream's Hauser's or one of his Romanios guitars. But I remember watching this and then seeing all this play out at the end and just thinking, oh my God, is this, did, did that really just happen? And uh, yeah, it looks like it really did. So Julian Bream, you can see him just like go for the guitar and, and then grab it like, oh, okay, nah, I will hold on to that now. And uh, so not only did he play an amazing performance, but he also showed uh, cat-like reflexes in an unexpected, uh, you know, dire moment uh, to save his guitar. Uh, from absolute destruction. Okay, so that really is all that we're going to talk about. Uh, thanks for listening. I will leave links all around for you uh, in the description. There's a playlist of these guitar technique analysis videos if you'd like to see some other people that we've talked about. I always love to hear from people. A lot of people share their insight on these videos, and it's one of my favorite things about making them. You know, people that have studied with these amazing musicians, or sometimes people have stories about you know, hanging out with them uh, at a bar after a concert and things like that, and you just get some really cool information. So I always love to hear um, what, what people have to say about their own insights to, you know, some of the things that these amazing musicians can do. If you'd like to support this channel, I'll leave links for that as well. And I do teach guitar lessons as well, so if you need to contact me about that, you can get a hold of me uh, through my website. Thank you very much for listening, and have a wonderful day.